living in today's world of science and technology and seeing the fabulous culture that we've created for ourselves, it's probably easy to look into the past and look with some pity or disdain at the ancients who saw the world through mythology. Those you know, simple, superstitious primitives who imagined that gods and goddesses were controlling everything. We've certainly achieved a much greater, more precise understanding of the nature of the workings of the world today, but that doesn't mean that the ancient stories should just be summarily dismissed. Ancient myth, ancient symbols, the rituals, um, the, the, the art that they created reflects an understanding of the world which is not always inaccurate. We saw, for example, looking at Paleolithic carving, the woman of Lozelle showed that they understood accurately that lunar cycles and menstrual cycles were intimately connected with each other. And this knowledge was essential in being able to successfully reproduce our species. We saw in the Mayan creation myth the other day that the Mayans understood accurately that of all the creatures of the jungle, monkeys were our closest relatives. So these stories record an understanding of the world in a pre-scientific way, but that doesn't mean that it was wrong or silly or superstitious. So it's a very rich uh, mental landscape that we unearth in studying myth, but we do recognize a couple of critical limitations in understanding the world through stories in this way. Number one is that if you believe that everything in the world operates because of gods and goddesses who are controlling it, that there are divine personalities behind the forces of nature, then the only way to gain some measure of control over your life and security that things will go well is to try to get along with these personalities in nature. And that's why ancient religious behavior was largely rooted in sacrificing to these gods, doing things to appease them, to keep them from being angry with you. Nowadays, if you worry that you know, there might be a lightning storm, do you sacrifice a goat to Zeus so that he'll be happy and not strike you down? No, you have a very different approach, and a more reliable one. And it may be that the ancients, when they saw the storm clouds gathering and saw it as the furrowed brows of Zeus, they had a little warning that they could hide, but you get much more warning today, because you can just turn to Super Doppler 2 and check the barometric pressure and look at uh, warm and cool fronts moving around. And the way we measure the behavior of the physical world enables us to have a much greater uh, control and understanding of how it operates. The other limitation is that while the ancient observations of the world, which were cast into story form, may very well have described with some degree of accuracy how things behaved, they knew when the storm clouds gathered that Zeus was angry and lightning might strike, you can't research it any further. You can either accept that Zeus causes lightning, you can reject the idea, but you're never going to uncover a science of electromagnetism if you're just sacrificing goats to Zeus. So while ancient mythology captured their direct observations of the world and put it in a form that they could pass down and make use of to some extent, there's obvious limitations to it. And these limitations begin to be uh, surpassed when we go back about 26 centuries to the early 6th century BC uh, to the pre-classical Greek world. The Greeks at this time are not an organized nation. They will almost never be that in the ancient world. The Greek peoples, though, are a collection of folks who share the same uh, religious beliefs and the same language, but they live in individual little city-states all around the ancient eastern Mediterranean. Quick and dirty map of the eastern Mediterranean. The Greek world are little cities like Athens and Sparta. But it's also not just the Greek mainland, but the Greeks have also settled along the coast of what they called Asia Minor, you would call Western Turkey today, in the islands, in the Aegean Sea. So all of this is the Greek world. And it's on the western coast of what is today Turkey, in the region of Asia Minor, that an entirely new way of understanding the world was invented. This is where philosophy is born. The word philosophy means literally love of wisdom. So philosophers are people who love wisdom. They seek to understand the workings of the world around them. Not understand it in terms of divine forces that need to be propitiated, 
These philosophers were the first to look at the world of nature and just wonder if they could understand how it works without recourse to supernatural powers. If we could just simply observe its mechanics and its operations and make a science out of it, what we would call a science. So philosophy is born by people who are investigating nature and trying to understand it rationally. And because nature was the first object of rational speculation, we call them nature philosophers. Today we would call them scientists. The first of these nature philosophers was named Thales. And he was from a town in Asia Minor called Miletus. And if there is a birthday of philosophy and science, it would be the 28th of May, 585 BC. From your reading, do you remember what happened on the 28th of May, 585 BC? There was an eclipse of the sun that freaked people out, and so there was going to be a battle that day that they canceled. Exactly. Now, eclipses of the sun had happened before. What was unique about this one? Thales had predicted it ahead of time that it was going to happen. Typically, when there's an eclipse of the sun, people take it as a bad omen. That source of light and life and justice and civilization suddenly going dark in the middle of the day, usually you know, they think the king is going to die or the crops will fail. It's always bad news. They never just decide to start happy hour early. They never see it as a good sign. But this one, because Thales was able to tell him ahead of time that it would happen, what he demonstrated was that the sun didn't go dark because the gods have gotten angry with our behavior and are thinking about punishment for us. The sun went dark because the mechanics of the universe had simply rolled around and it was time for the earth uh, to be separated from the sun briefly by the moon. In predicting it ahead of time, Thales showed that you could understand how the world works. And if you could understand it rationally in disconnect yourself from the belief that angry gods and goddesses are doing it all to you, you can stop being afraid of these forces because you understand them now. And what Thales does in the early 6th century is begin the process of developing our rational and what is today our modern understanding of the world 26 centuries ago. Now, Thales' ability to do this, the astronomy that he studied in order to do it, was not something he invented himself. Uh, where do you think Thales must have gone to have learned about astronomy? Egypt. Most likely Egypt. He could have gone to Babylon and learned it there as well, but Egypt was a whole lot closer. It was just due south of him in North Africa. And by his time, Egypt was already an ancient civilization. It had been around for thousands of years, and they'd had plenty of time to develop their own sciences. And just imagining Egypt in your mind, looking at its landscape, what kind of sciences, what kinds of uh, technology must they obviously be very good at? They must be really good at architecture because they build those big pyramids that are still there. And if you know anything about the pyramids, you know that they're also good at something else. That's astronomy. The three great pyramids at Giza, the Valley of the Kings, align to the three stars in Orion's belt. So they were able to line up these pyramids on almost a perfect north-south uh, axis and have them correspond proportionally to the positions of these stars, which for them were divine, but they were able to understand and, and make use of this. So the ancient Egyptians were very good at astronomy. They were very good at architecture. And they were also very good at geometry. In fact, they invented geometry and they gave it its name. Geometry has its origins in the aftermath of the annual Nile flooding. The Nile River gently floods every year, spreading out moisture and topsoil, and it makes lower Egypt just excellent for farming. The problem is that the Nile flood also washes away all the boundary lines between farmers' fields. So after the Nile floods recede, before you can plan, somebody's got to go out and remeasure all these fields and basically do some surveying. And that was the job of the priests. And this was specialized knowledge that the Egyptian priests had. And the name geometry is a reminder of the original function of doing it. Our root words here, geo, what does that mean? Like, like geology, geography, means what? Earth. Geo means earth. And metry implies measuring. Geometry is literally earth measuring. 
the Egyptian priests were able to use basic geometry and survey accurately these fields. They also kept this knowledge to themselves. As you may well know, knowledge is power, right? So if you're an Egyptian priest and you were kind of corrupt and willing to take a bribe, how could you use your specialized knowledge of geometry to enrich yourself? Yeah, somebody bribe you a little bit, increase your fields a little bit. Who's going to argue with you? You're the only one who knows geometry. So the Egyptian priesthood had uh, their own motivations for keeping this knowledge to themselves. The Egyptians did not have mass education. Their own traditions go back to uh, the earliest of the Egyptian uh, scientists, somebody who is credited with the invention of the pyramid itself, the builder of the first pyramid. He's considered the founder of Egyptian medicine and basically of all the Egyptian math and sciences. And he's somebody whose name you've probably heard of before. He's the world's first scientist. Who is that? Imhotep, right? Remember those terrible mummy movies? They're all going Imhotep. That's who they're referencing there. I think, I think they made up the stuff in the movies, but Imhotep was a real person who designed the step pyramid for King Djoser. In any case, thousands of years later, in the time of Thales, the, the descendants of this intellectual tradition are now a bunch of priests who are jealously guarding this. And for some way or another, Thales was able to get amongst them and learn their sciences. Uh, since he was going to go back to Greece with it, perhaps he just wasn't considered a threat. And also, he's from a wealthy family. I'm sure he had to bribe his way in. But in any case, Thales was able to learn these basic sciences from the Egyptians and take them back uh, to his hometown of Miletus, which is about here. And he begins teaching Egyptian sciences to his fellow Greeks. So Thales is the beginning of an academic tradition. And he does several things that are very important. One, he opens the first school in ancient Greece, where anybody that had the financial wherewithal to attend could increase their education. This isn't public school for the masses yet, but at least it's a step beyond what the Egyptian priests had allowed. More people are able to get educated and make use of an education. Secondly, he teaches uh, what he learns about geometry uh, to his fellows, not just in schools, but uh, to people that are merchants and shippers and so forth. Uh, he teaches them the astronomy that allows them to navigate by the North Star better and things like this. And more importantly, Thales is the first person we know in history to teach mathematics as an abstract science. Abstract math. Now we've already encountered the word abstract in this class. What does it mean to abstract something? To take the essence of, to take the essence of something and divorce it from the particular details. Like those Paleolithic fertility figurines seem to be abstract images of fertility itself. Okay? Uh, abstract math means that you're looking at what are written down as individual tricks to solve particular problems and taking the mathematical essence of it and then you can see how it applies to other sorts of problems. Let me give you an example. In Egypt, Thales would have learned the classic trick for how to measure the height of a pyramid or any other building. And it's the same technique that's used all through antiquity. We find it in medieval manuscripts of cathedral builders. This is a standard technique. You want to know the height of a pyramid. You can't climb up to the top and you know, drop a knotted rope down the middle of it. You need some other way of getting at it. So you would have learned this. You take a stick that's one unit, one cubit tall. It doesn't matter foot, mile, quatlu, whatever. And you kneel down and you eyeball it so that you're looking from the top of the stick to the top of the thing that you want to measure. And once you've done this, all you need to do is take a couple of measurements that are available to you and you can figure out the rest of it. Because this stick is one edge of a very small triangle that is also connected to what is conceptually a very large triangle. And what is the nature of the relationship between those two triangles? They're both right triangles, but what are they in reference to each other? Notice how they all have the same angles. This is both 90 degrees. They both share this angle. And so whatever this is, is the same as that. Two triangles that have the same, that are different sizes, but have the same angles are similar triangles. These are similar triangles. And once you understand that you have similar triangles, you can figure other stuff out. If these all have the same angles, that means the lengths of these sides are all going to share uh, proportions with each other. So let's say that this is one unit tall. 
and then you measure this, and this is, say, I don't know, four uh, units wide, and this is about uh, five, whatever your units are. What we're trying to figure out is the height of the pyramid, so what else do we have to now find out to then extrapolate the height of the pyramid? We've got to figure out one of these sides. That's the one that's under question. We can't fly up here and do this one, but we can walk our paces to the middle of the pyramid and measure this distance. So let's say this distance is 400. So we have a one, four, five triangle here and a similar triangle of which this side is 400. If this side is 400, what must the height be? 100. It's going to be proportionally the same as the smaller triangle. So by sitting down there and just sketching out a small triangle and then taking one of these larger measurements, you can do something kind of amazing. You, you can extend your mind out and measure things from a distance that you can't do directly. All right, now, back in Miletus, what good is this trick going to be? They don't have pyramids to measure there. But once Thales is able to abstract the principle of the triangle from this particular uh, little trick that the Egyptians knew, he was able to apply it to different sorts of problems. They don't have pyramids in Miletus, but they do have a lot of shipping. A lot of merchant ships going in and out. And there are little atolls and little islands and things that you need to avoid. So it's important to be able to guide a ship in accurately to port. So knowing how far out that ship is from the coast is a valuable thing to be able to figure out. How do you figure it out? Build a couple of towers. From these two towers, you take sightings each way, lay a little stick here, and establish two similar triangles. And since you know this distance, and you can easily measure this, you can then extrapolate the distance from each of these two towers. What Thales has done is taken the abstract principle of the triangle from this particular detailed trick with a stick and some ground and a pyramid, lifted it up, and applied it to a completely different thing. And that is why thinking of math in abstract ways is so powerful. The Egyptian priests may have understood this as well, but you don't see that in their writings. The Egyptian mathematical texts that we have basically are like a collection of word problems. If you need to measure this, take a stick this big, and it just gives you a discrete solution to a discrete problem. But you don't have a sense of the interrelatedness of mathematical theorems and how this is all a bunch of interconnected principles. And that's what the Greeks are going to start figuring out, beginning with Thales, continuing through Pythagoras, until finally we get to a, a later Greek named Euclid, whose name is famous because he was able to take all the mathematical traditions from before his time and collate them all together, show the interrelationships, and show how a certain small set of principles, you can start with that and then extrapolate all the more complex mathematical problems. Euclid's geometry was the standard textbook. Well, it's still the standard textbook. It's really not changed. It's Euclidean geometry is still completely valid. Uh, for, for centuries, we talked about studying geometry as studying your Euclid. And so this Greek tradition has turned out to be a very powerful one in the Western world. So Thales has opened the first school. He has begun to think about and teach math as an abstract set of principles, which is then going to, able, uh, to enable them to enlarge those principles and find more of them and find more applications. And then the third and final contribution that Thales makes, Thales asks the first philosophical question. What is the first philosophical question? What is the world made out of? What is the basic material of which the world is composed? Now the way that he would have phrased this question is like so. What is the essence of being? the capital B. And what he means by this particular way of phrasing it relates to an insight that Thales has about the world. Thales essentially know, wants to know what the material world is made of, but as he examines the material world, he realizes that there's something kind of perplexing about the universe around him. Now this is the central idea that sparks natural philosophy, that sparks science itself, 
uh, a central concept that we're still wrestling with today. And that is this. Everything in the world around us, everything that you experience, trees, birds, dogs, your hat, a giraffe, a house, my shoe, that desk, everything is temporary. Every single thing in the universe will come to an end at some point. A butterfly lives a couple of weeks and then it dies. Humans live 70, 80 years, we die. Tortoises and alligators can live 150, 200 years almost, then they die. There are trees that have lived for thousands of years, they'll eventually die. A mountain will exist for eons, but slowly the rains wash it away to the sea. There is nothing at all, there's not a single thing in the universe you can point to that will last forever. So if every single thing in the universe is temporary, how does the universe as a whole continue to exist? Why isn't the whole thing just falling apart by now? The Greeks believed that the universe was eternal. It had changed forms perhaps, but that the basic stuff, the basic matter of reality had always existed. Whether they were right or wrong about that doesn't concern us now, but they believed that the universe endured and it was this weird paradox that an eternal universe could be composed of transient temporary things in the universe. How does a collection of a million temporary things become this enduring permanent cosmos around us? Okay, that conundrum, that central paradox is what drives his early thinking. And Thales concludes that there must be something more to reality than what we see physically through our five senses. Everything we perceive, everything we hear, see, touch, taste, smell, we know comes to an end, but in our mind we understand that things continue to endure somehow. And so the first scientific theory, the very first step towards a uh, rational analysis of the world around us was to separate the world into two realms, which he calls the realm of being and the realm of becoming. both with capital B's. These are formal philosophical terms. Okay? The realm of becoming is the physical world around us. And it has the qualities of being imperfect, of being transient, temporary, and how do we perceive the physical world around us? There are five senses. But we know that there must be more to reality than that to account for the endurance of the universe. And so he speculates that there's this invisible higher realm or deeper realm, that there's a reality behind the physical world of appearances. And none of our senses can perceive it directly, but our rational minds comprehend that it must exist to account for the implausibility of the universe continuing when everything in it is temporary. This realm of being is a abstract realm. It is the realm of perfection. It is the realm that is permanent, and therefore accounts for the permanence of the universe and we only perceive this world through rational thought. We understand that it exists. And so his first question is, what is this essential uh, primary element that is the substructure of the physical world that we perceive? What is the real essence of the universe itself? And Thales' answer to the question, his answer to his first scientific theorizing, Water. Thales decides that perhaps water is the primary material of existence. Or maybe more accurately we should say the principle of moisture. That's a pretty reasonable guess. Thales lived in a world surrounded by water. We know that water is the primary requisite for life. 
You can go weeks and weeks without food if you had to, but about three days without water, you die. Rain, water must come from the sky in order for crops to grow. They understood something of the water cycle back then, that rain becomes the rivers and evaporates becomes clouds. They knew a little something about that. And everything that's alive has moist inside. You can take any kind of animal and open it up and it's wet on the inside. You are wet on the inside. You can take a, a little seed, a little seed that has the potential to grow into an entire tree and you crack open a seed and it's moist inside. It seemed to Thales that everything has moisture at its basis. Okay? So it's a pretty good insight. Now, the importance of Thales is not so much the answer that he gives, his theory of moisture as the primary material. What's most important about Thales is that he asked the question and he taught this way of thinking in this pleasure of inquiring rationally into the world to his students, who then took up the master's question and looked at it for themselves, decided they weren't quite satisfied with his answers, and came up with their own theories. And then their students thought about it and speculated further and refined and came up with different theories after that. What Thales really does is he began a conversation. 26 centuries ago, he began asking, what is the world made of? How do we understand it? How does it work? And 26 centuries later, after a lot of scientific revolutions and brushes with religious authorities and jockeying back and forth, we have slowly created this world that we live in today. A world in which when you look around, you don't see a single thing that's not man-made in the product of science and technology. And most of what you know about the world are things you don't see directly. You understand electromagnetism and gravity. You understand the physics and the mathematics that lie behind how nature operates. None of this stuff do you observe directly. These are, this is part of the invisible world that is in fact still real. And that's what Thales began to explore. What is behind the physical realm that we see with the senses that explains really how this world works? And now we live in this amazing world where even in Florida, on a hot late summer day, we're all sitting very comfortably in this room. Nobody's sweating, nobody's suffering in here, because we have machines in the ceiling that control the speed at which invisible molecules are vibrating around you so that you'll be more comfortable. The, the miracle that is air conditioning. And you will never get to air conditioning, much less rocket ships to the moon and all the other technology we enjoy, if we continue to approach the world through religious stories. It is only when you begin the process of trying to just rationally and dispassionately understand things that you begin the march towards the modern science and technology of our world. So the conversation that Thales began has been going on in an unbroken tradition for 2,600 years now. And we're still trying to figure out what is the essential basis of reality. We're still looking for it. We haven't found it yet, have we? You know, we get down to molecules and atoms and subatomic particles and electrons, and we're still slamming subatomic particles together and finding all kinds of weird stuff that spills out of it, we're still looking for that essential material. And it's not so much that we must find that material, but the process of looking for it has inspired so much of the science and technology that has made our lives so comfortable. The way we live today is how the ancient Greeks imagined that the gods must live. You have magic chariots without horses that whisk you to school. We control the atmosphere around us. We have machines that manufacture all of our things, like little automaton slaves. It's a miracle that we ever grew out of our earlier Paleolithic mythological world. I have respect for that world, but I'm glad we found another way of looking at nature. Now, the theorists who came along after Thales also suggested other theories. Uh, the student of Thales' student was looking at the idea that water was the essence of everything and thought, well, that doesn't work for me because, I mean, how does water become fire? I mean, that's just too different. Uh, how does it actually, the process of it work? And so Anaximenes came up with the idea that maybe air was the fundamental substance. Because remember, water is something you can see physically, you know, with your senses, you can, you know, sense it, 
And we need something that's real but beyond sensory experience. Now the air around us, it's real, right? Can you see it? Not directly. But how do you know it's real? How do you know it's there? Okay. I mean, you're breathing it, right? There's something that's happening here. You can see the effect of air when the wind is blowing on trees and so forth. You see it indirectly, the fact that there's air around us. Now, between me and you, is there a, a full continuum of air particles? Or is there just a few air particles flying around in a void and we just need to breathe a couple of them in to stay alive? How do we know that there's a full continuity of air all through the atmosphere around us? How do we prove that? You just need a root beer and a straw. Put a straw in a root beer, put your thumb over it, pick it up, and typically gravity is gonna make a fluid, which is heavier than air, fall downwards until it impacts something. Why does it stay in the straw when you do that? Why won't it come out? Well, if the fluid did come out, what would be left behind it if you're capping the top of it? It would leave a void, it would leave empty space, a vacuum. It's now a common element of science that nature abhors a vacuum. There's something in all this space until you get beyond the atmosphere into outer space. But um, Anaximenes was able to demonstrate this by observing little housewives watering their gardens. And they used something called a water thief to do it. A water thief is a little metal or terracotta uh, item that looks exactly like a shower head. It's hollow inside, full of little holes on the bottom. And you immerse this in your water. It fills up, you put your thumb over the top, you pick it up, the water stays in there. You take it over to your you know, vegetable garden, lift it, and you water your garden. Very simple little common household device in the ancient world. But Thales, observing this, realizes that this is giving him an insight, a clue, into the nature of the invisible stuff in the world around us, the air. So he decides that perhaps air is the uh, basic element, and he also comes up with a, a theory, a physics theory, essentially, of how the process of how this particle becomes other things. Through condensation and rarefaction, which is a fancy way of saying through heating or cooling. So he thought that air particles, when you uh, heat them up and agitate them, they become fire. And if you cool them, they become fog and mist and then water and then ice and then harden and then become solid objects. So through heating and cooling, air becomes the things we see in the world around us. Now he could have actually tested this theory. Because obviously this is not what the world is made of, and he might have been able to test this. How could you test the idea that when matter cools, it condenses and disprove that? And what happens? Okay, so take your root beer again, un unopened, put it in the freezer outside in the winter, and what happens when it freezes? It actually expands, doesn't it? So if he'd done an experiment like that, he could have realized that there was a problem with his theory, but you'll find that that's the one thing that the ancients did not do. They tended, these philosophers observed the workings of nature and they theorized and tried to come up with rational explanations, but ultimately they never tested their theories. That's gonna have to wait till modern science and the time of Galileo and the scientific revolution uh, for that to become a standard principle of science. That's the one thing missing uh, from ancient science that distinguishes it from our modern science. And the reason seemed to have been that you know, they must have thought they would sort of muck up the works. You know, you don't want to fiddle with it. You want to watch how nature operates and try to extrapolate uh, the principles of its behavior uh, rather than you know, laying your hand in and messing it all up. So that part is going to be missing. Anyway, the followers that continue are going to come up with other theories. Uh, maybe Earth is the basic substance. It's the most abundant thing around us. We live on it. Maybe the Earth gives rise to the things we experience. And then one ancient philosopher, a really weird guy, named Heraclitus had this other odd theory. It's, it's almost it's sort of Zen-like. Heraclitus thought that the only thing in the world that is permanent is change itself. Ironically. 
Heraclitus theorized that there was this kind of central cauldron of constant changeable energy, this flux, always in a state of motion. Fire was the simplest way of seeing this energy because fire is obviously a real thing, but it's always changing, right? You can't freeze it or put it in your box or in your pocket. It's this constant activity. Now remember for him, fire was a basic substance. And so he's often theorized that you know, fire is the basic element. But what he really means is that there is this potential energy that becomes the solid objects of our sense experience and then after a while becomes this central flux energy once again. And he also theorized that the total amount of things in flux always remains the same. It's just changing form back and forth. And so he intuitively comes up with a principle of modern physics. These science majors out there know what I'm referring to. The principle of the conservation of matter and energy. Matter becomes energy, energy becomes matter, but the total amount stays the same. It's just uh, essential elements that are changing form. And that was the original insight of the nature philosophers. So whatever their theory was, whatever these elements they thought might have been the essence, the important thing was that they were exploring, uh, asking the questions, and began to try to understand and, and solve this paradox of the world. How does a world full of temporary transient things add up to a permanent universe? Because the objects of sense experience might be temporary, but behind it lays this essential eternal material that's just changing form. Whatever it is, it coalesces together and becomes tables and hats and dogs and wolverines and giraffes and mountains and schools and houses. And we form it into things and after a while they dissolve back into its basic material only to be reformed later into different objects of sense experience. So the essential material is what's eternal. This accounts for the eternity of the universe. The individual things it becomes can then come and go, pass in and out of existence without the universe itself coming to an end. Now, the ancients who are theorizing here are giving theories that each have some kind of an appeal and probably have flaws in them as well. But one came along that became the most influential scientific theory of antiquity. And it came from a guy named Empedocles. who had this aha moment as he's looking at the theories of earlier philosophers and it suddenly occurs to him that why do we assume that there's just one basic substance? Why can't there be several things that could then combine together in different quantities and become the things of sense experience? And you might already see where this is going. Empedocles decided that there was not one basic element of the universe but that there were four elements. And what are those four elements? Earth, air, fire, and water. So we sometimes call this a compromise theory. He essentially combines earlier insights and comes up with a theory that a, a lot of the ancients, the majority of them, found to be a satisfactory explanation for the nature of the world around us. There's four basic elements that combine together in different proportions and in different configurations to become the things that we experience around us. So when you're looking at, say, a tree, the hard bark and the wood is the earthy substance in it. The, uh, the little crevices and the cells and the cavity walls are the airy substance in it. The sap that's going up the tree, the moisture inside is the watery element, and the living energy of it is the fire element. And if you can combine elements together and make things, it also ultimately holds out the possibility that maybe we can do this ourselves, that we can combine elements together and actually make things uh, and replicate the works of nature. You know, the, the, the original insight that would lead you know, centuries later to the Frankenstein novel basically combining the forces of nature and making life. Uh, originally, this has its origins back in Empedocles. His theory of the four elements became the standard scientific explanation for the world for over 2,000 years. 
from his time around the 5th century BC up until about the 17th, early 18th century, about 22 centuries, anybody in the Western world who went to school and got educated learned that the world was made of these four elements. And while today we've gone beyond this science and have a very different explanation for the physical world around us, it is important when you're studying history and literature, the humanities, to realize that most of the people you study, most of the people in history that left some writings behind that we still look at today, which means they were educated, saw the world like this. When you're studying Leonardo da Vinci, you're going to realize that his science is based on a belief that the world is configured in this way. Find ancient art reflecting this. When you're reading Shakespeare, and in The Tempest, they describe the warring of the elements as a way of referring to the storms up in the sky. When he uses the phrase, the warring of the elements, he means these four elements colliding with each other in the upper atmosphere, causing the resulting rain and lightning and wind that you see. When hailstone falls, you know, some of it's becoming more earthy-like. And so you'll get an insight on Shakespeare and on most of the people you know, up until about 300 years ago when you realize that their education, their whole worldview, was based on something much different. Now one more element is going to get added to this later. Plato, who we're going to talk about next week, his very last work was a long scientific treatise in which he tried to combine all the science that he knew of his day and put it into a coherent system. And it became very influential simply because it survived antiquity and was known through the Middle Ages. It was the only Platonic dialogue that medieval scholars had to look at until the Italian Renaissance when, they, uh, when all the rest of them were rediscovered. But Plato took the theory of Empedocles and thought, there's got to be one more element we need to add here. Because while this very nicely accounts for the changing world of the senses around us, what about the heavens, the stars, and the upper cosmos, which changes position, it moves around us, but they never seem to die out. Now we know that stars do eventually die out today, but Plato didn't know that, and those stars and these heavenly bodies seem to be eternal. It seemed to be this elegant higher level of reality in the cosmos above them. And so this reality also must have some basic substance that's unique, that's different from these things. And Plato decided, therefore, that there was a fifth element, a special element of which the heavens were composed, which he calls ether. Ether. So really it becomes the theory of the five elements. And anybody that went to school for over 2,000 years learned that this world was made out of earth, air, fire, and water, combining in different proportions, but the heavens were ethereal. They change position, but they're eternal and never die out. This gives us some cool vocabulary words we still have today. If I say that that music you're listening to is ethereal, what am I saying about it? It's that it's heavenly, that it's <laughs> mystical. Do, do you youngsters still listen to Pink Floyd? <laughs> I would call that very ethereal music, right? Mazzy Star, perhaps? 90s? Okay, lost you there. Um, so the word ethereal. And another word, another way of saying fifth element, the Latin word for five is quin, and another word for element is essence. We've been asking what is the essence of being. So this fifth element gives us this word, which is called quintessence. If I say that that poem you wrote is the quintessence of style, what am I saying about it? It's the very highest. It's of the very highest order that there's something timeless and classic about that poem you wrote. Pink Floyd is the quintessence of good 70s music, yes? All right. So words like ethereal and quintessential, words that if you have a rich vocabulary you might still employ today, are rooted literally in ancient science that is lost to us. So there is still something valuable in knowing these discarded theories of science because they had such a long time to be a shaping influence on Western culture. Now, 
There was another ancient philosopher that took a completely different tack on this. His name was Democritus. And Democritus and his teacher Leucippus had a different way of looking at what the basic reality might be. Can I borrow a piece of paper from you? By borrow, I mean have, because I'm not giving it back. Thank you. Democritus thought, look, all of these theories sound great. Maybe it's water, maybe it's you know, this or that. But ultimately, really, if you want to get at what is the basic building block of matter, not just have some theoretical construct in your mind, you got to get your hands a little bit dirty. So just take, and take anything, rip it in half. Rip that in half. Rip that in half. And keep cutting it in half and cutting it in half and cutting it 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 until you get something so tiny you can't cut it anymore. The Greek word for a cut is tom. So I've been sitting here going tom, 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 tom. And when I finally get a particle so tiny that I can't tom it anymore, then I have the negation of a cuttable bit. I have something that is atom, the atom. Atomic theory was devised by these ancient philosophers as well. They didn't know exactly the structure of the atom the way you know it today, of course. But they believed that there must be simply tiny little particles, so fine that they cannot be seen, that then combine together in different ways to make our structures. The atomists were the closest to modern science. In antiquity, though, very few people were atomists. Almost everybody that was educated believed with Empedocles that the four elements constructed the world down here. So this was a very minority theory, but it did survive. There's a few scraps and writings and references to it. And by the 18th century, when the scientific revolution and the study of physics and chemistry had gotten to the point where the four elements just wasn't explaining things anymore. There were just too many problems that it just could not explain. Then scientists went looking around for another whole model of thinking about the physical world. And they rediscovered this concept of simply looking for the tiniest uncuttable bit. And now we're in the age of telescopes and microscopes. We've been able to extend our vision. And so they begin using their microscopes and looking and looking and looking and trying to find. And they discover cells and germs and bacteria. And they keep looking and they keep looking. And then finally, with a very, very powerful microscope, they're able to just barely perceive this tiny little dot. So, aha, we've discovered the atom. Finally, we have found it. In 20th century physics has been the, age, the atomic age of trying to investigate the subparticles of the physical universe. Now, this atom that they found, is it really an uncuttable bit of matter? No. no. The atom is really a poorly named thing. They thought that they had found it, and it became the name, and we're kind of stuck with the term now. But when they're able to look at it closer and closer and closer, they realize, wait a minute, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. All these little electrons and protons and neutrons and particles and stuff. So is, is each of these an atom? Are these uncuttable bits of matter? No. no. You can cut those open and more stuff comes out. We slam those together and more stuff comes out. As I said, we're still really looking for the tiniest fundamental building block of reality. We haven't found it yet. And we now realize that we were a little hasty in calling this thing an atom. Nevertheless, it's been the search itself that has had as its byproducts the fabulous world that we live in today, thanks to science and technology. Now, all of this theorizing, all of this speculation and investigation is basically about trying to understand things we can't see directly, trying to make sense out of the invisible levels of reality that exist behind the surface level of appearances. And that is the built-in problem with all of this. Because the only way we can even start to think about reality is to begin with our senses. But our senses are not very reliable. They give us limited and, and fragmented information. Basically, 
This is you. And we live in these flesh bags, these bodies. And we have five little peepholes with which we can peek out our five senses. Vision, hearing, taste, touch, smell. But even the physical world that we experience, are we really seeing it all? No. When you take a straw and you put it in a glass of water and you look at it from the side, it looks like it bends, doesn't it? Is it actually bending? Then why do your eyes lie to you like that? When you go to the beach and look at the ocean, what color is it? Depends on which beach. Well, say a clean beach. Sort of blue, blue-green? Okay, scoop some of it up in your hands. What color is it? Clear. So what color is it really? What do we even mean by that? When I'm experiencing the redness of this hat, is it because my eye is grasping something red? No. It's because the electromagnetic spectrum is hitting it, and it's absorbing all the colors except the red, what is being reflected back out at me. So in a sense, the redness is every color except red. The red is the color being rejected by it. Do you remember in middle school when you learned about the electromagnetic spectrum? Everything from x-rays to cosmic rays? How much of that whole spectrum that comes down can you actually see? Tiny little bit. Did that freak you out when you learned that? No. It freaked me out. <laughs> to realize that all of this radiation was happening around me all the time and I can't see any of it except for this tiny little bit that we call visible light. But there's gamma rays and cosmic rays and x-rays happening all around you right now. You see a tiny little spectrum and that's it. If, you had, if we'd evolved different kinds of eyes, maybe if we're like the predator, we would see heat patterns. We'd see that level of the spectrum, but we see what we see. Can you hear everything going on around you? No. Right? Your dog can hear more things than you can. His, his range, his ability to hear pitch goes much higher than yours. Uh, have you ever been sitting in a quiet room and suddenly you hear ringing in your ears? Is there something actually ringing? No. Did you ever do that experiment in some, you know, eighth grade science fair where you blindfold a person and you have them smell an onion and bite into an apple and they'll swear they just bit into an onion? One sense can fool your other senses. So what we get in this little flesh bag that we live in, through the five little peepholes by which we can look out, are little bits of fragmented information which are often contradictory and unreliable. How can we know anything about the world at all given the limitations on what we're actually able to perceive? The only way is because inside our heads, our brains, is this rational mind, what we call rational thought. And the ability to recognize patterns, to come upon uh, questions and paradoxes, to see discrepancies and the, the ability to try to investigate and find solutions to them, the rational mind is able to process this limited information and create models, patterns that enable us to understand the world. These patterns we call science, scientific theories. They are not necessarily the truth about the world, though. They're simply a model that helps us understand how nature behaves. For example, do atoms actually look like this? Science majors? No, what's wrong with this Neil Bohr picture of the atom? This is like an 80-year-old, 90-year-old conception of the atom. What's wrong with it? What's inaccurate about it? Hmm? It's two-dimensional, for one thing. Are the ratios and proportions, the sizes, about right? No, even enlarge this big, each of these neutrons and protons would be too tiny to see. You'd have to enlarge this into the size of a football stadium to be able, like a little grain of sand, to actually see those protons and neutrons. Most physical matter is made out of empty space, in fact. Do these electrons move in these nice, perfect circular orbits? No. no. You know that they move in this strange electron cloud. And you can know where they are or how fast they're going, but not both at the same time for some freaky reason. So really, this is a simplistic model that we have far outgrown. And it's certainly not really an uncuttable bit of matter. So why do we still teach this to our kids? 
So is saying that Zeus throws the lightning bolt. That's conceptually easy too. What's the usefulness of this model still? What practical use does it still have for us? Even though we know that it's not truthful and accurate in what it depicts. It helps you visualize it, but you could just visualize Zeus throwing lightning bolts. There's, there's a reason we still teach this. There's something valuable that you can do with this. What can you conceptualize better by having this model in your mind? You can see the particles, the components of the atom, even though they're not really arranged in this quite this way. When you think about molecules, atoms bonded together into complex molecular bonds, how, how do these atoms bond together? By sharing electrons, exactly. So without this model in your mind, trying to imagine you know, molecular compounds and what electrons are sharing would be very difficult to wrap your head around at all. And you can't see any of this directly, but we know that that's in fact how it works. Did y'all have chemistry class where you had to balance chemical equations? That was hard, I know, hard for me too. Imagine trying to balance a chemical equation without even having this model at all in your head. It'd be almost impossible. So these models don't actually give us the truth about what nature looks like. But they are still useful because they help our limited rational minds contemplate the invisible aspects of reality. Without models like that, you'd have a, an almost impossible time even thinking about forces of gravity and electromagnetism and things like that. So, as you go through your science classes, I want you to keep this in mind. Take this from humanities into science with you. That the science that you study is not the truth about the world. Science is a series of models that enables you to think about things you can't perceive directly with your senses. And it is the updating of the models, the refining, the improving of these models, making them better able to allow us to predict how nature behaves, that the real value lies. The four elements theory of Empedocles was good science for over 2,000 years. It helped us understand how nature behaved. And when we got to a sophisticated enough level, we then moved on to another model. That's what a scientific revolution is, when you adopt a new model that helps you better understand how the world around you works. A thousand years from now, this might seem like primitive superstition. We'll have advanced our model so much further and have such a much more precise understanding. We'll wonder how do people believe such things. So it's important to keep that in mind. It keeps us humble as we investigate the great mysteries of the world around us. All right. Next time, we have one more philosopher to discuss. And he's the only one among these nature philosophers whose name you recognized when you were doing the reading. And what was the only familiar name to you? Pythagoras. Pythagoras. And what do you know about Pythagoras? Pythagoras. That theorem. Exactly. We'll talk about that Pythagorean theorem a little bit, but it's not what's really important about them. By the way, how many of you hate math? Raise your hand. You should love math. And after you talk about Pythagoras, hopefully you'll see why math is really an amazing thing you should embrace. All right. Thank you.